as I said to you kids before, there is opportunities to have a life and thrive in the world of theater and the world of entertainment and not necessarily be, um, I mean, you know, it's not all white folks getting everything, but they do get a lot. And it's really nice to see someone who's getting the opportunity not only to perform in different uh, medium, because the person that I have for you all today here on my first episode, y'all, yeah. is another Latino brother who comes from the very, his, his, you're mixing, you got a whole mix of stuff going on. Y'all, let me tell y'all about this guy. So Perry Ojeda is joining me right now. You notice I worked on my J's, Perry. Perry Ojeda, Thank who's you. here with me today. And it's so great because it is so much fun to talk to working actors that are actually out and doing and dipping. And he's got a lot of stuff that's kind of going on and floating on. He's got a new piece that is going to be streamed live with, a, and this is for you theater folks out there because y'all all mad that we haven't gotten the theaters open in New York City yet. This is your opportunity to at least get to see folks working, see folks doing stuff, because this is the thing, you know, everybody's got to keep their skills fresh. So the International City Theater is getting ready to stream a new play. Is it a new play? Yes, it's a new play by, uh, it's because I don't think this has been produced yet. So this is like the first. It has been produced around, this is the, uh, uh, the, the Southern California premiere. Got it. Got it. Um, a fabulous playwright, by the way, and some of her work you actually might be very familiar with. Um, Wendy McLeod has a wonderful new piece for, for us, <laughs> for, for those of you who have not streamed it yet or seen it yet, and it is called Slow Food. Now, again, clearly there's a play on words in here, and my guest, Perry Ojeda, is <laughs> the comic feature is from what I gather from the, the clips that I've seen. And he is a waiter who seems to have, um, how you say, overstepped your bounds? <laughs> like, it's so funny like you, because you everybody have... talks about this waiter as though he's the worst waiter that ever exists. And it's fun, you know, I, as my job as an actor, it is my job to advocate for the character. <laughs> and I will say that he thinks, he believes very strongly that he is giving all of his patrons the very best service possible. Mm. So it's a it's a little bit of a conundrum to me to even hear Wendy, the playwright, Wendy McLeod, discuss this experience of having the worst waiter ever. When I believe that she's actually <laughs> a character that is uh, endeavoring beyond to give the best service he possibly can. Yes. Yes. That's part of the that's part of the conflict of the play. Is right. That the the patrons, this lovely married couple. Um, which is the a funny thing about this particular play, I will mention before we dive deep. Mm -hmm. What she's written is this really wonderful comedy. And I haven't seen a lot of comedies about marriages that are working. Most right. comedy is built on relationships that are falling apart. And this particular, this particular comedy uniquely, so I think is, is primarily about a couple that's whose marriage is kind of working pretty well. Mm -hmm. And maybe they've even gotten a little bored, which is why they're even in Palm Springs. Right. And this conflict with the waiter gives them a cause to actually band together and defend themselves, if you will. Which it's I love the concept, though. I mean, and what's so great about it is that this, for, for, for Wendy, it's like, of course, being able to have another moment of extending herself artistically. But it's like, but she says it's based on kind of an experience of her own. So she's taken her own experience and giving it another twist, which I kind of love as well. But for you, Senor, tell me what it is like, because it's a, it's a nice cast too. It's, um, I've never have to read it. It's uh, you, Stu James, um, and Meredith Thomas, correct? And yes. the, all three of us come with very, really strong degrees. Which is great. Really I love strong the backgrounds and they were fun. I mean, talk about the best playmates you could wish for. And, you know, and it's, I think and it's wonderful because you're getting now, like, I mean, at least you're getting to play you're right now in the middle of all of this pandemic craziness, you're getting the opportunity to play. And for those of you who are wanting to see this, it's only going to be streaming for a very short time. I had the dates right in front of me. It is, hold on, y'all, because, you know, Keith is older. He just had the birthday. So Slow Food is going to stream April 29th 
through May 16th. And it's actually, I kind of like what they're doing that it's it's only um, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and it's dark. It's like the theater the run. Like right. a theater run, which is really kind of awesome. So that means for those of you who are, you know, needing to keep that experience at least alive somehow, <laughs> like this is the chance to do it that's very very fabulous so what's it feel like though now for you to you know be doing something new well i'm gonna tell you and i i think all three of us both Stu, meredith and myself and i think the director uh myra mazor um this was a real challenge yeah. doing something as as tight and witty and dense as this comedy is dense in the in the fact that it was like you know real ping-pongy very right. highly precise words almost like neil simon you know mm -hmm. a, a laugh every you know couple of seconds right this was trying to orchestrate something like that on a zoom call where there's right. a, a delay that you don't really notice until you're desperately waiting for your cue <laughs> or waiting for somebody to interrupt you to stop you, you um, it was hard wow. to record, and it was hard to record, hard hard to put together. It was a real challenge, and the 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 newfound respect I have because we all shot because of COVID in our own homes. So wow, we had to put up green screens and get lights and microphones and the digital HD equipment and props and costumes, and that team that's involved that you're dependent upon in the theater to help you look good. Right. and sound great and yeah. feel, feel like you can relax and do your job as the character not there none of that was there so we had to do it wow. so even though we had a, a normal work day of about five six hours it was preceded by a couple hours of prep and a couple hours of takedown and then like i i have never worked so hard for, but for it, a, it, a real reward because i i i hope that we pulled it off but well, uh, wow right was, now I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just. I'm just like. I'm thinking about the fact that you're doing all of that work because, like I said, some of the clips that you see online, it's like I. I thought that it was green screen, but I thought you were all together at one point in a scene that I saw. But now you're telling me she that they very cleverly. Cut. Wow. I had this idea. She sort of plotted it out like a like a multicam sitcom, and so imagining if we were at like Desi Lu Productions and we had right. the three cameras. And so if we're, if the couple's seated at a table and the waiter's standing behind, she had me s sort of move my camera back so I could be shot from sort of the knees up and right. made them each turn sideways with their specific eye line with the waiter positioned with the camera. And it was that kind of precise dynamic that we shot the... And even thinking about, well, if I'm going to hand you your beer, where is that coming from and how... Like it was, it wow. was, it was, it was a lot of pieces to a puzzle. And as long as I kept remembering, this is like solving a puzzle. It was fun and appealing and like a, a knot I could undo, undo. But the moment that I gave, the second I gave into like, oh, poor me, it suddenly <laughs> felt like burden. So it was like, it was like, okay, this is a real, this is a real lesson. This is like a way to approach your life. Well, you know what, the, what I find fascinating, though, is that you are, you're saying that you, you had to do all of the stuff in that space alone. And I keep thinking, like, one of the, the fundamental things about acting in terms of being able to do something like a play it's is that, that physical collaboration and that physical presence. Like, I mean, you hear about people when they shoot those big, you know, blockbuster things where they have the the green screen behind them and then the, the tennis ball that they're looking at in the right. It's like, you don't even get that luxury <laughs> to do this. It was you had, you had to figure it out on your own, man. One of the again, I, I give props to Myra Mazer, our director. Yeah. We spent we spent days doing table work. And for people that aren't familiar with that kind of, of theater lingo, we all sat in a Zoom meeting for again five, six hours, and we all agreed on sort of beat by beat in Wendy McLeod's excellent script, kind of what is the story that we're telling? What are the characters going through in this moment? What is their experience of this conflict? And I know that's the sort of detailed work you might approach like a Chekhov play with, but right. 
using those tools in a comedy, we, by the time we got in front of the camera, it, it felt like a collaboration because we had all agreed on the, on beat by beat right. the story that we were telling. And it was such a gift. Wow. So it did feel collaborative, regardless of the fact that we're all staring at a Separated. screen. It's crazy. I mean, but it's just, it, I, I love that because it's a testament of how theater is going to have to adapt. And you guys have really taken that to a different level in that, you know, I've seen a lot of one person shows that have been shot for things, which is great because you can have a set someplace and you can, you know, manipulate one person across a whole series of whatever things are going through. But the idea of trying to get three people to tell a story first and foremost, and then tell the story in this super unusual, highly overly enhanced kind of way to try to do it so that people can enjoy it the way we normally like to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's yeah. a whole lot of crazy, like in the mind of, I mean, that's, that's beyond some of the things that you've learned as an actor. Just, I mean, you've, you've, you've had to add new skills to your acting ability in order to be able to pull off a play teleplay basically you know what i'm saying versus in, in this short tiny my box of an apartment scenario i mean I'll, kudos I'll i'm like you know look, snaps board you can do you honey i was a young actor i had uh, i was able privileged to have dinner with marion seldes you know the great oh. marion seldes and she 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 was full of wisdom in lots of ways mm -hmm. um but one of the things she told me was the moment you stop adapting, you're dead. Wow. So you, your, your, your life as an actor is about taking on new challenges that are constantly being presented to you. Right. You know, you, you're constantly learning, you know, maybe you have to learn a foreign language or pieces of, like I remember uh, I, I was working uh, on a production of, of Light in the Piazza at South Coast Rep a couple of years ago and I was cast as Senor who mm -hmm. speaks primarily in Italian. Italian. Well, I don't know Italian, but, <laughs> but it was such a gift. It was such a gift. It, thankfully, the grammatical rules are close to Spanish, so at okay. least I was familiar-ish mm -hmm. with yeah. how to, where to begin. Um, but it's it's just an example of like, it. you can either think of this as a, as a boundary, a place that you're gonna dead end or an mm -hmm. obstacle that you can overcome. And thankfully, wow. thousands of people right now, especially with our with you know the wonderful union that we have behind us, Actors Equity, um, people are finding opportunities to continue to create theater in right. in the new kinds of ways that we have. And I think this is going to afford different opportunities moving forward. Because I speak to my friends in casting, and they're like having a feast because. Yeah suddenly now they're able to see new actors from different parts of the country, different parts of the world right. that they couldn't see. And they can, they can see a myriad of actors more because it takes 30 seconds to watch uh, somebody's online video as opposed to booking a room and schlepping across town That's right. and, and putting yourself together. The, it changes the burden slightly. Uh, some actors I know are complaining about like, oh, now I... Now I got to put up the lights and get us <laughs> find an accompaniment. Mm -hmm. But I I gotta say that I'm enjoying I'm embracing the opportunity to perfect my work a before right. I present it because I don't always audition the best. So many things can throw you. I remember those 20 years that I lived in New York. Somebody might you might trip up the stairs when you're leaving the subway. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you're shaking and thrown for your big audition for, I don't know, Les Mis or something, and you blow it. <laughs> and then, and it was just sort of, you don't get a take two. And in this, in this environment, right. you get an opportunity to perfect it before anybody sees it. Even That's a really in, good point. In, even in terms of, of uh, slow food, we had the opportunity if somebody went up off a line or we made a mistake in eye line or the joke didn't fly quite right, we could stop, reset and redo, mm -hmm. which yeah. you can't do in live theater. I mean, 
And sometimes in live theater, that's delicious. I will say this, the one thing I did really miss, and there's no way to make this up, is the, the biggest collaborator that was missing in the performing of live food was the audience. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing I can't wait for to get back to in, in whatever the next times. I know people are talking about, I want to go back to before and just like ragtime, it ain't happened. go back to before. No, honey. It, but whatever, but whatever the new times are, whatever we learn from this experience together and whatever comes uh, in the future, when we can be back together safely, I'm really looking forward to that collaboration between actor and audience. That's going to be something special. It's going to be great. I, I, I too, I'm, you know, I live, I miss an overture. You know what I'm saying? Like oh I weep, I weep at an overture when it's right. So you know, everybody's feeling the sting, everybody's slowly but surely finding ways to get back to it. But what's interesting, though, is that your journey to get to where you are right now started in, Mich in Michigan. Is that right? No. Yes. yes. It started in Michigan. And you are uh, Mexican. Is that correct? I'm the As son well of a Mexican uh, immigrant, okay. literally a migrant farmer that, that, uh, that moved from Mexico to Texas and then to Michigan. And then so, church meant with my very white mother. Which is, <laughs> and I look just like my dad. I look just like my dad, dark hair, but he has dark skin. Mm -hmm. And I have one sister who has very, who has sort of more conventionally olive brown skin. Right. And one sister who has blonde hair and blue eyes. Wow. And then me, um, and so we, we've, as a trio, as my family, we have this very strange experience of, especially the, in the year that we've lived through, talking with my sister Jody, who has a darker complexion and looks mm -hmm. more conventionally Latino or what we think right. of, you know. Um, some of the experiences that she shared with me in, in this time of bigotry being in your face, yeah. is unacceptable people wow. stopping people people stopping her and members of our family in the walmart parking lot saying go back to your country look i live here i was born here like born here. what and the three of us are all desperately trying to learn how to speak spanish but my father was ashamed when we were kids, because i'm a kid you know i grew up in the 70s and 80s i'm turning 53 in a couple of days so and, well, hold up. The middle aged man. Wait, hold, hold up. Turning fifty three, y'all, and looking snatched. Hello. Well, just let me let, let's you take gotta, a moment. You got to think. Of the very good lighting because got, and the uh, zoom filters are your friend. Let me tell you that right now. All right. I, don't, I see you moisturizing. Don't try to play me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry, but but you were saying. I'm sorry. Well, the I, I wish, and we all regret now that we that we weren't more proactive as younger, uh, younger people, making our father and our grandparents speak to us more in Spanish. And now my father is a, is a fluent Spanish speaker. He's, he makes his living um, in the Michigan court system as a translator and helping people maneuver through the system uh, to emigrate legally from Mexico and other Latin American countries. It's, it's really, it really consumes a big chunk of our life so wow. all three of us are desperately on Duolingo every day, trying to, to outpace each other. How long can we, how much more can we learn and planning trips to Mexico? And I still feel like it's a huge part of my life that like, I, I need to explore and exploit more because I'm, I'm a Latin man. I'm, I'm a Latino, I'm a Hispanic man. And this is a huge part of who I am and my experience and how I perceive myself but often, particularly because of my fair skin, and I think a little bit of my patrician demeanor, <laughs> people people treat me like I'm like I'm just another middle-aged white guy, and right. that's their own perception. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. That's okay. Well, all right. Well, then that that brings up two things for me because I, I love that you and I have a very similar uh, situation in terms of our backgrounds, and that. Both of my parents were from Honduras. They were both Honduran immigrants. So I'm a first generation American and technically you're half a first generation American, I yes. guess, if, if you want to do that. And, but I grew, I was born in, in New York in the sixties, 
like you know, you're just a little you're just a little younger than me. Um, but like, I was born in New York. 10 or 20 and, minutes, maybe. Right. And and you know, my parents were black and they were working very hard to try to not seem any more other than being black was in the 60s. So for us, me and my brother, we didn't learn Spanish growing up. So we had to like, you know, I took Spanish when I was in school later on, but it was, it's still very difficult for me because my Spanish is, you know, I could pretend, but I ain't going to be, you know, I say one word and you're going to get it, but I can't speak it, you know, but it's, it's, you know, it's muy difícil para hablar, I know, but, uh, you know, you got to find the time to practice. So what, like for you, you have to think, I think you have to think in character in order to at least be able to play with the language more to speak it, but that's another story. But I understand the, like, I, my parents were not necessarily embarrassed per se. They were more embarrassed of the fact that they were not as educated as other people, other my friends' parents. Um, so for them, that was where their embarrassment came from. However, they didn't, you know, they didn't push that out on me, at least. I didn't feel that. My older brother had a lot of issues, but I never had that because I grew up at a time, literally in Texas, in the 70s <laughs> uh, black that's a lot latino of fabulous later on you know it it was a challenge but i but it's interesting to hear you say that with your siblings because you literally now have both sides of the coin in front of you like you can see the difference how your one sister is treated and, and yourself as well how you're both treated differently because of the way that people perceive you and let so, me tell you a secret what was curious about it is when we would go and visit our relatives in Mexico, my fairer sister would get preferential treatment. Interesting. And the darker Interesting. sister, because and the, and it's baked into the that Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. This is a worldwide phenomenon. I think as Americans, we think of that we're the only ones doing this, but Latin culture has its own this this own bigotry of where we think of. First Nation peoples and darker skinned peoples is less than, and we got to stop it. Right. People are people. People are people. And the, the blessed part is that we are allowed to be different and we are allowed to be Man. from ever, ever. So let us celebrate that and stop being crazy. So, so that's interesting. So when I look at you and I, I see you and anyone who looks him up and please do when you have time, um, I see a white guy basically. But it's until I see your name, Perry Ojeda, do I now have it in my brain to at least ask question, then think, oh, I, I see a little Ricky Ricardo energy in there. I see, you know what I'm saying? I could, I could see some suave, but what, it's, what it is is, oh, that you keep the name out so that people know who you are, or at least will question. Was that intentional? And there was a question at the very beginning of my career. Um, a couple prospective reps that I never went with suggested that I change my name. Remember, this was in the early 90s nice. when I started my professional career. Um, and the idea was that I might get more work if I had a simpler name to pronounce. Obviously, right. Ojeda is a very common Latino last name. Right. Like being Smith or Johnson right. in a Europe in a sort of an Anglo Anglo centric kind of perspective right. but I've always been proud like I said I it's always been who I am and right. actually my first name Perry is is a surname two generations back on my mom's side and Ojeda is obviously my grandfather's name so I like my name yeah I like that it's, it, it represents me exactly who I am, which I'm a synthesis of these European, Latino, and First Nation because my grandmother is Mayan and Aztec. You better get it. So, you, get, so you got that good hair, that Indian hair. <laughs> I have really, good, I really, I have a lot of, I have a lot of hair and I have people that insist, uh, friends of mine, they're like, what do you use to color your hair? You don't have any gray. And I'm like, mm -mm, nothing. That's just, Boom. that's just the Mexican. That's the Mexican in me, how you living? So how wonderful is it because you're getting to celebrate being all of you. So 
Now, how does that translate later on? Because again, celebrating your pride in being Latino, celebrating your pride in being Mexican, owning your last name, owning everything about it, and then the gay stuff starts. <laughs> like, well, the, the thing we have- How did you handle that? Is the way my parents met is they met at the Mormon church, the Latter-day Saints. Ooh. So I was raised in a very conservative environment and everything you see in Book of Mormon, the musical, is pretty much yep. accurate, which is why <laughs> the Mormons don't like it so much, or they or they're thrilled to like it, depending on who you speak to. Right. But it's it's a conservative, uh, it's a conservative religion, and yeah. mostly about unacceptance of of LGBTQ people. Right. So it was a long road, and it's funny. Um, it, when I was about 30, I got interviewed for something, a big project I was doing in New York by a journalist named Chip Defa. And I got a handle, I got to specifically call him out because I think he was working for the New York Post at the time. And he said, I hear you're gay. And I was so, Ooh. I was so uh, thrown that I didn't know how to respond. And remember in the 90s, wow. we we're still reeling, we we're still reeling from the AIDS Very crisis. Much. Yeah. People considered it uh, career suicide to come out, and I didn't know how it's to respond except to say the truth, and so I did. Wow! I said yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a gay man, and I'm making my living in musical theater on Broadway, and so there. I'm the lead of this project, and that's that's the way it is. And I, you know, I don't have anything. To, I wasn't dating anybody at the time, which was true. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I had sort of put my relationship with Mormon Mormonism on hold, so I didn't feel like I was betraying anything. But like like we said before, every every obstacle or hurdle that you might be thrown could be an opportunity. And Chip allowed me the opportunity to become more myself in that moment. And I've never looked back. Wow. And it's not always been easy. Um, particularly uh, in the early 2000s. I mean, I can't, as a middle-aged gay man, I can't believe what we've, where we've gone in the yeah. last decade or so with gay marriage and right. it, it being yeah. utterly unremarkable. Yes. Um, and people talking about gender, gender and sexuality fluidity and these conversations that seem almost mundane now Truly, we take a step back and just look back 10 years ago in my life, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's extraordinary that we're having this yeah. conversation. And it's also extraordinary that in my life, it's so, it's not that it doesn't matter, it's that it's no longer remarkable. It's yeah. just part of the human condition and part of how we're all diverse and on the scale of fluidity. And the, right. the sooner we can accept that in ourselves and each other, the easier it's all gonna become to get along together. That's so, awesome. And it's funny, um, before we started our interview, you, were, you, you asked me about um, Leah Delaria and Jesse Tyler Ferguson, whom I had the pleasure of working with yeah. on the production of On the Town that I did on Broadway. And that was directed by George C. Wolfe. And all three of those people at that mm -hmm. time, which we're talking 1998, so I was 30 years old. Um, I, I think anybody can say that's still a relatively young man. Yeah. But these were out and proud performers then. Yeah. And they were groundbreaking, especially when you speak of, when you talk about George C. Wolf, embracing and promoting, he was all about my Latinoness. He was like, talk about that. Talk about that you that you come from a Latin background and bring that to the character of Gaby that I was playing at the time. Right. And he embraced the idea that these two gay actors were portraying a heteronormative um, mm -hmm. characters, but having a really great time with it. Yeah. And being excellent musicians and super funny and and bringing a queer perspective to it that maybe was always there because nothing against Nancy Walker, but she always seemed <laughs> a little, little kind of 
She was a little. Did we can. You know what? We can. We can say. It. I she love little, her. I love. She had a lesbian overtone going she on. She did, and she I had a little bit of a lesbian. That, and I was drawn to it. There was of a course. there was a masculine element in her femininity that seemed really appealing to which I could identify, and we, I love that. Her, but but we know her as the bounty woman. <laughs> <laughs> we know her as the or, or Rhoda's mom or Rhoda's or, mom like we we have a very connected history to her of, of watching her be that way of course now here's your gay moment do you know remember the movie that she directed she directed some crazy disco film uh can't stop the, the music people, right yes can't stop the music can't stop the music and infamously like gave up halfway through the production or something something crazy I have to talk to my friend Felipe who's the um the Native American of the group. It is funny because you know how you, I, I look at you and I wonder like of the people that you've gotten to work with, I know you've worked with Cherry Jones who I absolutely love and- Oh my God, up. I kissed <sighs> the, the ground she walked oh, on. What a, what a sweet, wonderful. There are so many great actors and actor, actors and actresses that I've worked with over the years that were great examples of being of the fact that they were out also was such a demonstration to me that it was right. okay to be myself and be committed to this art of theater. And Cherry Jones is absolutely Cherry Jones, Jack O'Brien, George C. Wolf, um, wow. more recently, like uh, some of the television writers and directors that I've worked with, like Mark Cherry from Desperate Housewives That's with Why Women Kill. Um, David Warren, who is a fabulous theater director and television director, doing Miss, Miss, Miss Alliance on Broadway and being married to Peter Frechette. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's a whole world of, it's, it's okay for people to be publicly themselves. Yeah. In a, way that, in a way that used not to be the case when I was, when I was growing up. I mean, thank God for Harvey Firestein because I, yep. I didn't know that, other than that crazy movie, Making Love, do you remember that? Yes, and with um, with with uh, uh, the hot hunky uh, Harry Hamlin. Harry Hamlin, who, by the way, still hot. Hello, still hot. Him, you know, with the red. And it's so funny because as we sit here and we we kind of throw those things out like that, I for, I'm looking at you and I remember that we are basically the same age, and so yeah. the the references are the same. So what I'd want to ask you then is. I, I just recently wrote this piece for Hey Jorge about Little Nas and how Little Nas's video, Little Nas X, excuse me, his video where he's lap dancing with the devil and sliding down to hell on a, a, um, a, a, a stripper pole. I have not pole. seen about it, but I've heard it. I've heard, You've about, heard about it. it. Right. So I was watching the video and I was like going, oh my God, like not from the fact that he's lap dancing with the devil or sliding, because I'm like, whatever, do you? But what I found so thrilling was that this young little queen, I don't know if he's a queen queen or how he rolls, but we know he's gay. We all know that he is gay. He's black and he's gay. And I'm looking at this young man, he's 20 years old, and he has literally set the entire conservative world on fire because he's just living his truth. And I just, you know, at one point I had to stand back because I was kind of like, Ooh, these kids today, they're just so exhausted with the WAP and the this and the that. And it's like, when I look at what, he, what he's bringing, he is opening a door of, um, he's, he's becoming a role model in such a way that you and I did not have growing up. Well, we I had like Paul Lynn. When we were growing up, it was such, in high school, when I was struggling with my sexuality and sexual identity, it was such a, it was such a minefield to talk about anything, any any same sex attractions or or crushes or anything that that seemed other than heteronormative, right. anything that was outside that little narrow definition. And now, young people today, when I have the pleasure of speaking or talking to them, or when we were collaborating in the before times, <laughs> everybody when we were young, way less they seem way less troubled by it. Right. And you're right, younger artists today with these platforms like YouTube and the like. Twitter, yes. Twitter TikTok. and TikTok, the, the people of like minds can reach each other and explore and like take a little yeah. 
what's what's mm -hmm. this about? Let me click down this rabbit hole and see where this leads. And like like I said before, it allows for there's nothing so bad that is so bad that we can't talk about it. Right. Right. And I'm quoting that's from a musical 1776. Hello. <laughs> I can't a more white musical than that musical. <laughs> but it's, it's true. Nothing so bad you... that we can't talk about it. Terry Ojeda, I feel like you know, and I don't mean to be cheesy, but I feel like I have met somebody who I know. I, I don't understand how we didn't meet back in the 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 um, on the town period because I'm sure you all came. I I know that um, Leah was dating people and Jesse Tyler used to come in all the time. Well, you so can I, never I forget, wonder why Keith. You can never forget that I have this weird Mormon background. So, especially in my 30s and even through into my 40s. I didn't drink. I rarely oh. went out. I, I, you know, I was, I, I lived like a little nun. And so, <laughs> and not that I didn't have my adventures. I mean, please don't. I was just about to ask. You know, don't misunderstand, we, we, but I certainly presented to most people of like, oh no, I'm, I have to go <laughs> pick la voce. I have to go home. And for the most part, I did live that kind of monastic lifestyle, but ooh, when I let loose, I'm, I'm afraid you lost of- your mind. Thank God I never became a celebrity because the, the skeletons that would come out, people would be like, oh, Perry, you're not all that. I got some, I got some things mm -hmm. to tell you about when you were out so-and-so. But see, here's, here's something that's really fabulous that you just said that I think is so true, is that imagine had you managed to make it this far in your career, having hidden, ducked, dodged, evaded all of those questions about being gay, and then it takes just that one queen from your past that remembers you being sloppy at some party with pictures that could ruin everything. And the whole idea that if you took control of that at the very beginning, like you did when that guy asked you that question, which by the way, as I'm glad that he, your response to it was that way, but I think as a person who's trying to do this and be in an interview setting, like that is a shitty way to start an interview. It really is because I felt like when you said it, I felt attacked and I was like, I hear you're gay. It's like, really, bitch? See, that's me. You know, and it's like, what else did you hear, Ma? Scratch up, guys, because let me let me clarify some shish kebab for you. You know, that's Chip that's and I, I could I tell I had an ally in the room and he was presenting an opportunity that I had a choice at that moment. Yeah. I had a choice to. And he gave me, he, it was totally an open door. Like you can, you can, you can stay hidden or you can, you can come out. Yeah. And. But that should have been your decision before you sat down to have that interview. Because again, when he walked in and said, I hear you're gay, that means that your choice is you better tell the truth. Because if you don't, everything that you say to me in this interview, I know you're hiding. I will know that you're faking. This. I think, I, you know, and I think that, the, uh, you know, I, you, I was on the harbinger or at the cutting edge of recognizing that as a, as a performing artist and even in public, even in regular life now mm -hmm. in the, in the, the modern century, privacy is an illusion. So it's much easier <laughs> to simply tell the, truth. tell the truth and whatever, whatever you personally decide is your own moral compass. Mm -hmm. live by those rules because the moment you violate them somebody's going to be like standing and pointing mm -hmm. and saying but you said this and you did that right well we're all going to make mistakes but lord knows we're going to make mistakes and i have many like i said i got i got the mm -hmm. things that i'm certainly not a proud or I'm, you know, mm -hmm. i don't want to know. brought up or talked about mm -hmm. well, we you know, again you and i were running around new york city all kinds of scandal could we could have bumped into each other and didn't realize that that's a scandal yeah, there. you know what i'm saying so remember those aol chat rooms eek <laughs> the ones that you could set up and just sit and wait for people to come to you hello like and a then, like a like a venus fly trap <laughs> and then you wait you wait for the uh the hour for the picture to, to finally unveil because it took forever over the modem. And then you would pray Beep. that nobody- Beep. <laughs> Pray the call waiting, you, you forget to turn off the call waiting. And then someone calls in the middle of the picture and it's ruined and you gotta start all over again. Yeah, yeah. we've come a long way, Perry. We've come a long way. <laughs> we've come a long we've come, way. We've, we're like Virginia slimming it now, baby. Now, 
You know what I'm saying? Now like, there's there's a I'm I'm ho- I, there's so much bad news all the time, right. and there's so many so many so many things that we needed to talk about this year that because of this year of isolation, we are finally finally having conversations about. And conversations are not action. We need to take action. But in terms of race relations, in terms of sex, uh, sexual identity, in terms of gender identity, in terms of, in terms of environmental awareness, I can't even say concern because it's a flipping crisis, but there's a lot that needs to be done, but at least we're talking about it in a way that I, I can't remember in my lifetime that it was ever so present in everything I'm in everything I'm doing all the time. It's so interesting. Do you find that in terms of your art choices for yourself that you're gravitating to a different, um, you know, like I a, a different kind of experience? Because like I, you know, as a comedian, started off as a comic, and my thing, you know, was I had the big boa when I'd come on stage because at the time when you know when we were running around New York. I was the only out black gay male comic. There were a couple of black girls that were, you know, lesbians, but I was the only queen standing out there with his boa and just sassing it up. And it's funny because now that I've gotten older, there's still a lot of that energy, that sass to be there. But like my focus is just so completely different. And I think it's because, you know, I have had to really pay attention to what's happening in the world because it is truly, like you said, the environment, we've well, got racism, we've got all these things that are happening all at the same time. I'll tell you, Keith, to bring it back to the reason we're talking in yeah. Slow Food, one of our cast members is Black. Yeah. Hugh James is Black and the two other cast members, at least by perception, are white. <laughs> so it automatically brings in a whole different awareness of what we're talking about even though even though it may only be subtextual but right. there's there's a power dynamic that's involved in server and patron and right. what what used to really drive me up a wall when i was working as a singing waiter <laughs> uh, is when somebody would treat me like a servant yeah. as opposed to a hired professional who's come in to be you know snapping their fingers or saying Mm -hmm. sweetie or patting me on the butt because lord knows when i had a butt that was patable you know worth patting okay wait let's now we're gonna talk are you single not not, i'm asking for me but you're not single. you married you got the whole i'm not married but i'm not single that's a that's a that's a that's a little Mm. bit of a conundrum in the in the in the 10 year long relationship i've had with my partner no it's not he he uh Getting married is not is not a thing that we. He, I bring it up every now and again, and he's like, mm. <laughs> "Wow!" But you know what? Here's the thing about that: it's like we have the choice. Yes. It's not. It's not that everybody needs to run out and get married. It's just we have a choice now. That was a choice that we were always supposed to have, but somebody decided that we couldn't, and it's like you know, suck it. That's what I want to do. If I, you know, now. I'm sure living in sin, Mr. Mormon. <laughs> is- I will say this. You know what's funny? My next job after after this all gets put to bed, I'm, I'm about to go and do um, the Utah Shakespeare Festival in Southern Utah. Nice. So this affords me the opportunity for the first time in my professional career for all that Mormon side of the family. And when I, when I say it, there's a, it's a whole special breed of Mormon that is in Utah. I, yeah. I grew up in, in, a, in a non-Utah Mormon family, you know, growing up in Michigan. But the reason they were Mormon is because one of those Utah Mormon missionaries from Salt Lake, who was born and raised and born in Utah, born and raised in Utah, came with his companion to my mother's family and my father's family and converted them. And that's that's where they met. Interesting. So this whole side of the family now exists in Utah and Idaho and Wyoming. Um, but I'm also counting on all those, all those Mexicans from Arizona and Texas and <laughs> to schlep up to see me in Utah too. So, um, so the, there's some opportunity for some, uh, 
some diversity there, it sounds like. <laughs> Diversify your audience. How fabulous. Yeah. Oh, well, Perry, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time because um, RuPaul's finale is coming up on. And as much as I'm digging you. We got to go. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, we can be pals and brothers and sisters, to be. but we got we got we to gotta get ready for Ru. But I want to tell you, thank you so much for taking the time to sit and chat with me. Um, well, I'll figure pleasure. out a way to I hope do people do tune in to Slow Food because it's something yeah. we're really proud of. And International I, City Theater is a, is a theater that I have a relationship with. I performed there um, uh, in a wonderful play a few years ago, Is He Dead?, which was uh, by Mark Twain. This is a totally different, sophisticated, witty comedy that I think lots of people can relate to. And they can get tickets at the ICE, the International City Theater website. At, it's uh, www.internationalcitytheater.org for tickets. Now, and at the point that is really fabulous, as we said before, it's streaming from April 29th through May 16th. And it's Thursday, Thursday, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays only because the theater is going to be dark Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So Amen. if you guys want to, as I said to you all before earlier on, if you are theater people and you're missing some theater, this is an opportunity to see theater. Like I always tell people that it's always these smaller plays that get to tell the messages and stories that you know you can't get on Broadway because they're trying to make a buck. And so there's an opportunity, well, it's the truth. And so now you have an opportunity to get a little bit of, of uh, story, you get a little bit of fun and it's a very interesting dynamic of watching a couple <laughs> who doesn't really seem to have problems. We've never, the, here's the thing, all of us have never met in person. That's We've true. Met online. We've only rehearsed online. We've never, I, I never got to meet Stu. I've never met, I, I was recently cast as Meredith's boyfriend in a movie. Uh huh. I, I booked another project. Like, like I said, I'm going to Utah. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be able to play her boyfriend. I, I, I did have the opportunity to meet her and I've missed it. If you missed so it. Another, another gig came another, along. Yeah. Well, how, and again, a challenge that, you know, creative minds managed to figure out and have, taking theater to yet another level. So Amen, congratulations on, on this particular piece. Um, again, oh, 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 before I forget, Queens, Queens, there is a short film that is on Amazon Prime, Pride, starring oh. this man, who, by the way, I was telling Michelle, our producer earlier, that I, I was having a night where I was sitting up just clicking around on Amazon Prime just to see what was gay theme that was on there. And I ran across your movie. And so when I was doing the research and I saw you had clips, I was like, oh my God, that's a great movie to talk. We'd have to stop and talk about it at some point again. I just, you know. That's a, it, that's a really a beautiful film. film. And it's about, it's about, it's about gay identity. And how and forgiveness. And forgiveness. forgiveness. And forgiveness. Mark Saltarelli was the, the writer director of that film. It was amazing, wonderful experience. Great people involved. Polly Perrette from NCIS LA, or mm -hmm. NCIS, excuse me. And then not for nothing because I am shady and shallow. There's a fabulous scene when they're shaving, he and the boyfriend together. I'm just saying, it was very, just and you were living actor, your dream. Here's, here's my favorite thing. Mm. Actor, uh, Anthony. Yeah. Wonderful, straight kisser. Now mm. married with a wonderful son, but oh mm -hmm. boy, could he kiss! So, but see, but it doesn't matter now because no matter what, he can have his fabulous, gorgeous he wife, his beautiful. Can, so, you just look at him and be like, "I've had you." <laughs> it's like, <laughs> "I've had you." It's okay. I know that we will never be together, but I turned around, you. Keith. What, baby? He had. He had uh, we had him. Ew. <laughs> now, Perry, you know I love you. I do. I love the fact that we're the, the same age and we have the same experience. So we have to connect beyond this. So I would love that. Well, and they well keep doing stuff and figure out a way to come back to Broadway. Maybe I'll, I'll work on that. I promise. You know, there's because let me tell you something. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen and it would be wonderful to have you back. It'd be really great. You can do something with Karen Olivo and y'all can solve this whole Latino, you know, uh, uh, in the theater moment, you can take some away from Lin Manuel. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, make room, Lin. Make room. Just make room for us. It'll be great. So, again, thank you so much. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure. Again, an international. Ooh, I had it right in front of me. Wait, International City Theater. 
internationalcitytheater.org to see this fantastic place, Slow Food. Give it a check. Give it a pick. And it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday only. So don't don't think you don't make plans on those other days. <laughs> and we're gonna be back. <laughs>